Hey people, we wish we were reviewing the T14 Gen 2. This is not that. This is probably 98% the same laptop. So hardware wise, it's basically identical to the AMD version of the T14. However, it additionally has some ISV um, software support. If anything, it's probably a little bit more versatile. Knowing that basically the same, we've asked you what to do and the two third of you preferred for us to just get on with the P14S Gen 2 review. I think it's good cool because um, the T14S in the UK as of now is still not showing us available. So we've ordered this about six, seven weeks ago and it's here. We've had about a week to test it. It's encouraging. Let's uh, get to it, shall we? Firstly, the chassis, it's not really changed since the T490 significantly. For this generation, the biggest difference is some slightly larger air vent on the base cover. It's just marginal improvement. I think the lid material is also a little bit different now. It's a little bit more difficult to leave fingerprint marks, but I mean, obviously I can see fingerprint marks still on this, but generally, if on the outside, the base feels quite firm. Very little um, flex. I think with a workstation laptop, you just expect something quite robust. So in all rigidity sense, it's very good. I'm not trying to break it, but yeah, it, you get a sense it's very solid. It's very nice. On the base cover, it feels a little bit more hollow. So on the inside, we've got the touch module. It has a little bit more glare, if I can be honest, than the usual Full HD IPS screen and the base option is brighter. Over time, on this part of the bezel, you will see more scratch. Um, I think that's a comment on the design durability. I think the trackpad usually is the first bit that gets scratched. This is not new chassis, so we basically know it's exactly what's going to happen when it ages. So trackpad wear, keypad wear, and some marks on the bezel. So that's the normal stuff. I think so long as you don't drop the laptop too much, um, you're not going to get too much wears and bump. So it feels a little bit hollow if you tap it, but if you just generally hold it with one hand, it still felt, feels quite nice. You get a tiny clicky song when you lift it up this way, but I think try it with both hands or try hold it in the center, that's, that's probably a more sensible way. So attempt at to one-handed opening will probably not be successful. Um, yeah, no, you have to open with both hands. As you can see, if we nudge the laptop beyond a certain angle, ah, yes, you can see it's lifting the laptop up, potentially a little bit more airflow, uh, but it also means that if you do that to your laptop, then the rear edge may get scratched. So when you move the laptop around on a desk, if it's beyond a certain angle, just make sure to move the lid forward a little bit. Okay, let's chat about the ports. On the left hand side, you've got two USB Type-A ports. Some people use this for the docking. Additionally, you've got a one USB Type-A as well as the HDMI and audio jack. Micro SD card would be probably quite useful. It's, it's not a full size SD card, but then again, I personally prefer to use an external card reader just in case card slot gets damaged. On the right hand side, you have the ethernet port, which is good to see. And additionally, the second USB Type-A as well as the optional smart card slot. At the back, you've got the SIMS card tray. The difference between Intel and AMD model is that on the Intel model, you have Thunderbolt 4 on this generation. However, on the AMD, these two are just standard USB Type-A. So they charge, you can plug in your USB Type-A accessories, but the more um, advanced functions, for instance, external GPU, it just doesn't get supported without Thunderbolt. I guess if you're counting on plugging in a more powerful external graphics, for instance, into a Razer Core, then that's not something you can have on the AMD model. However, you do have a more powerful GPU, so that's something else. So the keyboard we have here is an backlit. It actually gives you a good sense what it's like to have compared to the backlit version as we have on the Gen 1. So typically on the NAND backlit version, the surface is a little bit more textured. It's um, less smooth than the backlit version. Some people really like this. Some people just can't live without the backlight. I think personally, I would um, get the backlight um, version just because it's quite easy. There are two levels of uh, backlighting. The keyboard is just a pleasure to use and um, to type on. This is probably totally anecdotal, but I think the non backlight version we have here is some, has a little bit less flex than that, but I think it's just a unit variation. It's the same 1.8 millimeter keyboard. It's brilliant. It's um, something that you do wish more of the newer Lenovo laptops have. They started moving to a different keyboard trend 
where it's less travel and a little bit less um, pleasant to use. But this one, same trusty design, same old keyboard, very nice. Likewise, the old click button is just such a joy to use. And I think compared to the last generation, the trackpad is just a little bit more smooth. I really like this quite smooth texture. Not everybody does. It probably also means that it might wear out a little bit less quickly, but who knows. The button and the combination of the trackpad is really nice. The trackpad is not as wide as on the slimmer T14S model. However, I think the better feeling click button and the keyboard more than makes up for it. I can't really comment on if the fingerprint sensor has improved because, well, some idiot ordered it without the fingerprint sensor. The comments from the, using the previous generation is that the fingerprint sensor works when your fingertip is dry. If you just had a glass of water or something and try to use it, you have to dry off your hand, obviously, but it's uh, it's been a slight hit and miss for the last generation. I guess somebody probably can comment on this. But yeah, generally, it's the uh, same design, same trusty build, very little difference. As for the display, we've got um, quite a reasonable brightness, um, about 10% over the rated figure. Color gamut, it could be better in sRGB and in the Adobe RGB, this leaves something to be desired. I think if you really want to the ultimate image quality, the 4K panel is absolutely stunning. However, it also dents your battery. Hopefully in the future, Lenovo might consider adding a Full HD panel that has very high color gamut. Just a quick webcam test. This is still the 720p webcam, so there's a no 1080p option at the moment. General quality, I'd probably say it's, it's passable. If I quickly move across the frame, sometimes in some applications, it, there's just a lag in the audio for it to catch up to my position, I think it's, it was quite visible. Um, when we tried it on the previous unit, and um, it's struggling a little bit with the auto backlight. Generally, the quality um, seems um, okay for a work laptop. It's nothing stunning, for instance. Um, if you really want something great, having the external webcam, it would be so useful. The color is a little bit um, washed out and I think the shirt color is a little bit more light in person. It's I think the facial feature is smoothing out quite a lot. You can't see as much detail on the hair and also I think on the edge and also there. Ah, there you can see um, it's darker across the frame. My colleague is going to switch off half the light. We're going to see, see how it um, does. Ah. Okay so it adjusts the brightness and as you can see it's uh, a little bit a more pale face and probably more noise reduction. And the shirt color seems to have changed. So it's passable. Um, would you like to switch off the other two? I mean, so now we're at um, basically just, oh, okay. So if you're in the dark, it sometimes think that there's absolutely no backlight. So. This is um, emulating where there's really, really not great light. I think even Mac would struggle here, but yeah, it's get yourself some light um, and maybe don't be in this environment. Generally, the audio could be a little bit better, uh, hopefully less lag in the next version. And the picture, hopefully we can get autofocus in the future at some point and image processing at the moment. It um, lags behind the competitors such as um, M1 based Mac and HP at the moment is also doing something quite interesting. Overall, it's a passable webcam. I think we're just in a context where we're demanding more from webcam with more people doing hybrid work mode and um, work from home. Hopefully, in the next one, they can improve it. For the meanwhile, if you get this laptop, get yourself a Logitech webcam. Let's take a look on the inside. So immediately on the base cover, so six captive screws. Once those are loosened, you just pry open. We've already uploaded the Intel version of the disassembly. The AMD version is pretty much the same between the P14S Gen 2 and the T14S Gen 2. Just a heads up, before you try to take off the base cover, take off the SIMS card tray first, otherwise you won't be able to get it open. It comes off reasonably easily after you pried it open. So on the inside, you'll see one upgradable RAM slot. This lets you potentially go up to 48 gig of RAM. So if you have the smaller 8 gig on board, then you can only go up to 40 gigabyte of RAM, which is still a lot. Some people might prefer to run their system in channel so that means you'll have 8 plus 8 or 16 plus 16. There's also one user service for SSD slot. This is M2 single-sided. If you try to put double-sided it might bend and we just generally do not recommend that there too. If you look at here so we've got the antenna for the 4G. This um, the antenna we're not quite sure if it's on all models. It depends on your spec. It generally says WWA and upgradable. 
if it's there. You also see that on the AMD model, the Wi-Fi is swappable, which is quite nice. So on the Intel model, the Wi-Fi is actually soldered on, which is quite strange. The catch, if you buy the AMD model, is that in many regions, if you buy the AMD version, they ship you a real tech Wi-Fi. For most people, this is probably okay. If you use Linux, then maybe the support isn't as great as the Intel version. So Otherwise, you've got the Dude Heat Pipe heat sink, which is quite useful in dissipating more heat. On the Intel version, you have a single heat pipe. On the Intel Plus dedicated graphic model, you may have the Dude Heat Pipe. So if you do have the AMD, then this is an off to decent start. We've got the battery 50 watts hour. Do wish it were maybe 60 watts hour. That would be really useful. However, we're probably a little bit stuck for space on this um, design. Furthermore, you can see the BIOS battery can be quite easily serviced. One USB on the right hand side, you can see there's a dot board here. Oh, you know, it's probably quite a serviceable unit. It's a little bit strange, again, to have the onboard RAM plus one serviceable RAM slot, but it's Better, I guess, to have this than the completely soldered on board RAM, which uh, some of the newer ThinkPad seem to be taking. Also grateful that the SSD is uh, the full size, not the 2242, because that one is, um, has more size than it at the moment. Overall, in upgradability, you could be looking at a Ryzen 7 with your 48 gig of RAM, with uh, the up to probably two terabyte of SSD and Intel Wi-Fi. It's um, quite a decent to business workstation. If you do need more RAM, you'd have to either go for L14, which has a do RAM slots. Alternatively, if you need even more RAM, you can go with a P15 Gen 2, which lets you go up to 120 gig of RAM. As for the temperature, when we're running stress test on the laptop, the right hand side really does get quite warm. So that's where the fan exhausts the heat. As for the base cover, you can see the heat pipe is um, quite hot in that specific section. The front of the laptop is quite cool, so that's good. Perhaps the best idea is to not put this on your lab when you're heavily stressing it. On the Intel model, we've definitely seen quite high peaks. On the AMD, you also see uh, peaks in some workloads. Looking at the speedometer result, this is uh, mostly web performance. The AMD is quite impressive. Intel has definitely improved since the Gen 1 as well. There is that Mac thing, which, yeah. Moving on. In our Premiere Pro test, as you can see in blue, the Do channel is um, quite impressive. It's definitely faster than the Intel version on the bottom, which was a single channel. However, on the T14S, you can see just how impressive the Intel model can be if it's matched with fast RAM, so that's in red. With the AMD model, you can't really speed it up by connecting an external GPU as you have um, here on the cases with the Intel-based ones. In the Lightroom test, you can see that it's uh, definitely faster than the Gen 1, and the Intel model actually does quite well here. The last result, I think that's a single channel on the T14 Gen 2 Intel. So medium battery runtime test, this is where we refresh five tabs continuously and also run a 1080p clip at the forefront. So it does quite well, it's only a little bit behind the T14S Gen 2. Keep in mind the Intel model has a 14% larger battery because that's the slim S model. The Intel model of the T14 Gen 2 would have the same battery as the AMD version. As for the Blender test, it doesn't really take a genius to work out. AMD's processor is very impressive. As for the Cinebench battery drain, we've uh, tested the 10 minutes and 30 minutes Cinebench, trying to see how much they drain. There's some differences, it uh, seemed to cope actually quite well compared to the older model and also the Intel model. So we've got the Cinebench R23 here, we've got the AMD on AMD. On the single core, you can see that there's probably up to 20% gain. This is actually really impressive. More responsive uh, single core performance is great. On the multi-core, you get a more modest around maybe 10% gain. This is um, also good to see, but it's just also quite interesting that perhaps at some point these 15 watts chips will run into power limits of what you can accomplish on that power level. Okay, this benchmark, you can see generation on generation. There's a reasonable performance boost going to the Gen 2. Also, if you go for Do Channel, that's actually quite a nice jump. So make sure to get to Do Channel if you want to do much gaming or graphic stuff. In our games, just to caveat that the Gen 1 has a 16 gig Do Channel, Gen 2 has a 32 gig Do Channel. So that could affect the benchmark slightly. As for the speedometer, when you go from AC to battery, there is some performance deficit. It's around 20%. As for the Geekbench GPU, you can see noticeable 
um, performance deficit when you're on battery. In Geekbench single core, you can see the performance um, deficit there when it's on battery. It's uh, almost back to the Gen 1 AC performance. As for the Geekbench 5 multi-core, it's a lot less noticeable gap than when it's a single core. So this is quite um, encouraging that when you're doing heavier stuff, um, you're not going to lose as much performance when you're on battery. Exploring the performance in detail, we're looking at the performance deficit when you go from AC to battery. You can see that whilst the overall score doesn't change significantly, most of the difference seems to be from the disk mark and those are the 2D graphics. Some benchmark will probably not be able to notice a difference, but others seem to be able to unmask this deficit a little bit more. Okay, we've got the Geekbench for single core. On the S model in red, you really can see the Intel model stretching its leg, whereas on the AMD Gen 2, you can see that it's marginally better and closer to the Intel than ever before. However, not quite. We've got Geekbench for multi-core, quite a boost from single to channel and this is the same case for the gen 1 however the gen 1 had bigger difference going from single to do whereas on the intel model it's also a difference between single and do but the intel model is not quite as fast for the multi-core now we've got the geekbench 4 gpu you can see the t14s gen 2 really stretches it's like this is because the intel model there has a quite fast memory. Whereas if you have the Intel model on single channel memory, it's not as fast. There's also a difference between the S model, which has the 4166 memory versus the 3200 on the regular T14 Gen 2. When the T14S Gen 2 with AMD comes out, it's expected to have faster memory. The P14S here, you can see there's quite a boost when you go from single channel to do channel, but it doesn't quite reach the Intel level. Looking at the Geekbench 5 single core benchmark, you can see Intel just about edging ahead. This is where I think the AMD model makes quite a noticeable bump, generationally speaking. As for the Geekbench 5 multi-core, this is probably the reason why you might prefer the AMD model for the multi-core and the Intel model for the more single core sensitive stuff. Now, as for the Geekbench 5 GPU, you can see that Intel XE graphics is definitely quite powerful when it's on do channel. AMD is closer than before. In the Heaven benchmark, you can see on the AMD, it's decent. It doesn't have eGPU support and some of the Intel definitely manages to stretch ahead, especially if it's a GPU enabled. There's quite a noticeable bump if you go from single to do channel. As for the heaven bench score, this is roughly proportional to the frame per second. As for the Luxmark CPU plus GPU, AMD seems to make a decent progress for going from single channel to do channel. However, you can really see the Intel edging ahead here. As for the Passmark overall score, it's quite a strong preference for the AMD, especially when it's running do channel. Intel benefits less from do channel it seems here. Even the Gen 1 seem to cover the Intel model right now. So here's a breakdown of the pass mark. There's some variation in the disk mark, so I wouldn't think too much of those. I think on our Intel models, we were specking them potentially with higher specs, so that's probably what correlated with faster SSD score. As for the memory, this is really interesting for me. First gen AMD, this is um, where it seems to suffer more when you go single core. However, on the second gen AMD, it doesn't seem to suffer as much when you're on single channel. However, the boost when you go to do channel is um, significant. The 3D mark, Intel and AMD Gen 1, both benefits from having channel. Same with the AMD Gen 2. AMD Gen 2 makes good progress here. 2D mark is where the AMD seems to be really strong here. It hasn't really changed from before in terms of the um, lead. As for the CPU mark, you can see quite clearly that um, AMD is uh, somewhat dominate and that gets um, combined into an overall score. This is a uh, disk benchmark. On the left hand side, you've got the 256GB um, PCIe 3. It's a decent respectable. On the right hand side, we have uh, O singing, O dancing, Samsung 980. Supposed to be PCIe 4. Now we're looking at the speed, it's basically, it basically seems to be capped at PCIe 3. The marking material on the Intel model seems to suggest that it's capped at PCIe 3. This is not explicitly mentioned on the AMD model. However, on the AMD model, we just don't seem to be getting the PCIe 4 speed neither. So here's our 60 minutes CPU plus GPU stress test. On the top right chart, you can see that the Gen 1 in red, it goes up in temperature a lot more quickly than the Gen 2 in same workload. 10 minutes in, it's already dropping the temperature. Whereas the Gen 2 in green, it goes up a lot more slowly and a lot more steadily. It doesn't seem to drastically change in temperature until 45 minutes in. It means perhaps it doesn't throttle 
as much. Secondly, you can see the Gen 2 in green is overlapping onto the blue line and it's consistent at around 24 watts or TDP. This is uh, in contrast to in red where it um, drops quite a few times and more noticeably so. It doesn't seem to drop until 45 minutes in so it seems to be able to handle the TDP a little bit better. We're in 21 degrees some um, air con office so this is some um, steady temperature same controlled for both. Now looking at the average CPU clock in red you can see that the Gen 1 goes up to higher clock but immediately has to come back down and it oscillates back and forth quite noticeably and around 10 minutes in it seemed to throttle back very noticeably. It goes back up but it oscillates very heavily. By contrast you can barely see the green line moving until 20 minutes in. It just indicates that the Gen 2 can maintain a possibly higher clock on average for possibly longer. And keep in mind that it's the same controlled temperature, same control setting. Secondly, we're focusing a little bit more on the GPU side of the CPU plus GPU workload. As you can see on the bottom left in green, this is the Gen 2. They seem to be able to maintain the frequency um, reasonably well and um, it dips here, but um, you can see in red, the Gen 1 dips more quickly and oscillates more before then. Uh, when the Gen 1 goes back up, it oscillates quite heavily, whereas the Gen 2, it um, goes up and holds the clock more stably. As you can see again, 15 minutes in, in the red, the Gen 1 oscillates very heavily again. The Gen 2, around 45 minutes, it does seem to clock down uh, for about five minutes. However, it then recovers quite quickly. It just seems a little bit more smooth. And as you can see, the GPU utilization is quite consistent for uh, both. So it should be a comparable workload. What we have in blue is slightly different workload. And as you can see, it's um, steadily downclocked. So I think it's being recognized as a power virus here. So it's um, not able to fully use up more power. So that's why we have two workload for the P14S Gen 2, just to have a play. Okay, so let's sum it up. For us, this is basically our T14 Gen 2 review in proxy. So we're not going to do that again because that's literally reinventing the wheels. What I'll probably say is this generation is actually really quite exciting. So last generation, one of the key features that was missing was the 4K panel. So it's been resolved. You can get the Adobe Vision 4K panel now. That's quite decent. Um, I think overall on the AMD side, the performance of the CPU is um, definitely better. Um, more noticeable in the single core than the multi-core, I think, for me. The integrated AMD graphics is also a little bit faster. It's impressive in delivering additional performance with very little impact on the battery life. If anything, the battery has got marginally better in our brief play with the laptop. Being a T-series, it's an understated design means that it can blend into quite a few different settings, whether you're in a cafe, in somewhere off-site, etc. It's just, it just looks like a laptop people don't pay too much attention to it. So it just gives you some anonymity, which is quite nice often. I'd probably say that the casing, the fingerprint probably shows a little bit less um, easily on this model than the previous, but maybe I'm just nitpicking. Um, and I think for me, the on the inside, it's really good to have the same keyboard as well as the trackpad, a really decent click on the trackpad. The trackpad itself, um, for me, it uh, feels a little bit nicer. It's still not quite as smooth as what you have on the Mac side, but uh, this is what you get. The laptop has a decent upgradability in the RAM and SSD, so that's quite nice. As for the pricing, it's a little bit more competitively priced than the T14S and also the X13. Those are slightly different machines, but um, there'll be customers who really prefer those. For the X13, it will be the aspect ratio and more portable chassis. For the T14S, it's just something slightly lighter. So quite a wide range of products that Lenovo has in their ThinkPad lineup this year. As for the areas that could be improved, well, for some workloads, this will probably be less suitable than the Intel model. By that, I mean, it doesn't have the option for the NVIDIA graphics, uh, it doesn't have Thunderbolt 4, and it also doesn't have the eGPU support. So those can ironically be what helps the laptop to be a little bit more durable if you use those uh, features. So you get a little bit more strong CPU on the multi-core side, but you trade off with some longevity consideration um, if you were to go into e 
GPU stuff. Now this is quite a durable laptop, but there's parts which are less durable. For instance, on the bezel, I think within two to four months, you can start to see keyboard marks on the bezel. So it's it depends on which laptop bag you're using, if any, and if it presses in, but it's just a little bit strange. As with the same chassis design, you can't change the laws of physics, so it still gets warm and um, toasty at the heat still exhausts onto your hand on the right hand side and the front edge of this design is still quite sharp so if you have it like that it's still a little bit sharp but all these as we previously have said if you get an external keyboard external mouse it reduces that strain and also a one-handed opening please can we have it in the future that would be really nice based on that is that some laptops would have moved to the 4 by 3 aspect ratio or even 16 by 10 so this one at 16 by 9, it just feels very regular. It's what you're used to, but you know, some people will probably be wanting something slightly longer along the one side. Another point is some of the features you might expect to be standard in 2021, for instance, a backlit keyboard on this one. We've customized this version of the laptop, so it wasn't standard. You sort of, it's probably just me, but um, having a backlit keyboard as a standard. It's just, it would be really nice. It's, um, you see manufacturers moving away from TM panels. Maybe this is the next trend over the next three to four years, who knows. Having that option for the 4K panel is really nice. It would be even nicer if um, over time you can see the speaker improving with a little bit more bass. Because more people are working from home, they're probably a hard demand for a better webcam. So hopefully over time, we'll see improved webcam on the future generations. For this one, it's just about passable, an external webcam recommended if good first impression is required. Overall, um, not much difference. It's just a performance focus update. This year, I think the HP versions will be interesting if you want something thinner or lighter. The Lenovo Zone L14 Gen 2, that will probably be worth a look if you want 64 gig of RAM. This one's really nice. Um, it's a good way to get into AMD if there's any. So I think that's definitely worth considering if you uh, looking at a new laptop this year. I mean, personally, if you have the AMD version of the T14 Gen 1, I'll probably not upgrade. There's some performance, so maybe if the marginal gains are worth it for you, then it's probably worth it. You'll know that yourself. If you're coming from, let's say, T490 or earlier machines, then this would probably definitely make sense. Um, and obviously, just to point out, there's parts shortage, global pandemic, so there seems to be a really long shipping time. So there's probably a point where with this machine, you can't get the perfect spec. You can probably just get the one that's closest to what you need. And um, you know, when things ease again, you'll probably see better supply for your next laptop. We hope this helps. If there's any other question, please do let us know. Um, it's taken us quite a while to do this. Uh, so we'd really appreciate the like and subscribe if you can. Thank you.